A warning to listeners before we begin. This episode contains extreme racial slurs. These are for the purposes of historical accuracy and by no means reflect mine, the cast, or the crew's point of views. If you prefer a version of the episode that has these slurs bleeped out, you can skip on over to the next episode, which has everything here, but racial slurs are eliminated. So again, if you do not mind the racial slurs, keep listening to this one, and if you want all the content here without the use of racial slurs, jump on over to the next episode. And now, on with our show. When I was in high school, I was supposed to read many wonderful works of literature. Growing up, I always loved to read, and that's what led me to become a writer. Here was the problem. Between working 30 hours a week at the grocery store, theater rehearsals, the mountains of homework from my honors and AP classes, and the desire to be a somewhat normal teenager who had a less than average social life, I literally had no time to read. Sparknotes became my best friend. Now, thanks to COVID-19 and the wonders of modern day technology, I've been listening to dozens of audiobooks through my local library. Chapter 1. Deciding I should probably give the time these wonderful novels deserved, I've been going back through and rereading books from my high school English classes. Let me tell you, I missed out on some amazing stories. The message in The Great Gatsby really struck a note with me, but I can't believe we never talked in class about how Nick Carraway is obviously a little gay. Of Mice and Men packs so much story into such a tiny book that I was shocked I didn't have time to read it. And then there's To Kill a Mockingbird. This is the one I think I gave the most attention to in school, but over time forgot a lot of what happens. It's fascinating to me how a book that just turned 60 years old is just as relevant today. Now, if you haven't read it, I won't spoil too much for you, but let's just say it revolves around the extreme racial tensions in the South and how white folk could essentially get away with lynching African Americans. Author Harper Lee probably didn't know what would happen in Mississippi about a year after her novel was published. Imagine with me the small town of Liberty, Mississippi in Amite County. In 2010, the town had a population of 728, so in 1961, I'm sure that number was significantly smaller. Liberty is home to the first Confederate statue ever erected in Mississippi, so you can imagine how the Caucasian population felt about African Americans in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement. It was nearing 90 degrees in the town square, and the air was thick with humidity. Dozens of people stared wide-eyed at the remains of what had happened minutes ago. A white man in his early 40s stood by a rusty pickup truck with a pistol still smoking in his hand. On the ground before him lay a clean-shaven black man with a trickle of blood flowing from his temple to his graying hair. The town knew both men fairly well. One was a quiet activist, and the other a loud state representative. The politician quietly peeled his button-up shirt away from his sweaty skin and placed the gun back out of sight as the sheriff ushered him into his cruiser. It was clear the politician had killed the other man, and yet, the sheriff wasn't taking him to jail. The sheriff was making sure the murderer was safe. Welcome to Dead Time Stories. In 1953, eight years before the murder, Eldridge Willie Steptoe, or E.W. as history usually calls him, nervously waited in a courthouse for his voter registration to be approved. The employee behind the counter looked up from E.W.'s test with a scowl. Boy, you ain't smart enough to vote. That's what's wrong with you Negroes. Y'all think you need the same rights as us, but you dumber than a fifth grader. As a matter of fact, The 37-year-old E.W. had a 6th grade education, which was enough for him to know he had a right to vote, despite the bigoted laws Mississippi put in place to prevent him from doing so. With the tip of his hat, E.W. left. On the outside, he seemed calm, but inside, a fire was starting. 
When he returned to his farm in Amite County, E.W. was greeted by the welcoming glow of fireflies and his neighbor, Herbert Lee. Evening, E.W. How was it? They let you register? Nah. Said I wasn't smart enough to pass the test. Oh, hogwash. You smart enough to run that farm, ain't you? Shoot. And I'm smart enough to know what the NAACP's doing for folks like us. Since I left that courthouse, I can't stop thinking about starting a chapter here in Amai. Uh, I don't think a lot of folks would like that much. The Watts don't have to know about it. We could host meetings right here on my farm. What are y'all boys talking about over there? The two men turned to their neighbor across the street. Eugene Hunter Hurst, or E.H., looked at them from his porch, his plump white face turning a slight red. Herbert gave him a nod. Evening, E.H. Just asking E.W. how his registration went. E.H. shook his head. You're a good friend, Herbert, but Negroes don't belong at voting booths. If I was in office, I'd see to that. Not wanting trouble, Herbert only smiled. Oh, of course, E.H. Have yourself a nice evening. You too, boy. E.W.'s dream of starting a local NAACP chapter was initially a success, with over 200 members regularly attending underground meetings at his farmhouse. (laughs) Good evening, everyone. Let's begin. Now, our first order of business. Of course, nothing good can last, and one night in 1954, members of the KKK along with the local sheriff interrupted a meeting. Everyone out back, now! Come on! Faster than green grass to a goose! E.W. ushered members out as the KKK burst through his front door and terrorized those who couldn't quite make it in time. Personal items were smashed and a cross burned in the front lawn, but E.W. bravely faced the men as his own escaped. Hello, folks. What can I do for you? We heard y'all's having a party and didn't invite us. He got up in E.W.'s face. Y'all better watch out, because if you don't, I'm going to cream your corn. He looked down at the table and snatched a piece of paper from it. (laughs) Ha! Well, looky here. List of members? E.W. reached out for the important document, but two other men shoved him to the ground. Go fetch anything else he's hiding. E.W. shook as the clan scoured his home. With valuable information now in the hands of terrorists, membership declined. The KKK's goal of intimidation had succeeded. It was time for a dramatic change, and as the civil rights movement gained traction, E.W.'s fire grew hotter. He knew he needed himself and others to gain the right to vote. At the time, only one African American man was registered to vote in the county, and he didn't exercise that right, presumably from fear. Enter Bob Moses. Bob was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, sometimes called the SNCC, and other times SNCC which was a group of young African Americans bound by the common goal of challenging white supremacy. The The 26-year-old Bob arrived in Macomb, Mississippi in August to start SNCC's first voter registration campaign. By the middle of the month, he accompanied an older gentleman and two middle-aged ladies to the courthouse to register. They arrived at about 10 in the morning and were greeted by a nasty pimple-faced boy. What do you want? The elderly gentleman nervously stared down at the white man behind the counter. I, I, uh, I, I, spit it out, boy. These three people would like to register to vote, please. Who the hell are you? My name's Robert Moses, sir. I'm with the SNCC, which I believe you know helps Negroes vote. The worker scowled up at Bob. I already got a lady in here registering. You have to wait. Yes, sir. The four took a seat and patiently waited. Their presence caused quite a stir inside the building, and as people passed, they couldn't help but stare and mumble under their breath. At some point, a state highway patrolman named Officer Carlisle took a seat across from them, his eyes never leaving theirs. By 4.30 that afternoon, all three had finished their registration and left with Bob. I'm so sure glad you was there, Mr. Moses. I was fixing to skedaddle as soon as that officer sat down. You can't let those folks intimidate you anymore. You aren't breaking any laws. 
As he adjusted his mirrors, Bob caught sight of Officer Carlyle's cruiser following extremely close. Now what's the problem? He pulled off to the side and allowed the officer to pass. Once the police car was a bit ahead, Bob continued his drive. Uh, he's turning around, Mr. Moses, and his lights are on. Oh, don't worry. I'll handle this. Bob once again pulled over and got out of the car as Officer Carlisle cockily sauntered over. Good afternoon, sir. May I ask why you pulled us over? My friends are very frightened and I- Get back in the car, nigger, and follow me. Officer Carlisle shoved Bob back into his own car and slammed the door. Bob obeyed his orders and followed the officer back to McCombs Police Department. Sit down and don't speak. Bob calmly took a seat in a chair and crossed his legs while Officer Carlisle and his co-worker flipped through a law book. Ah, here we go. Boy, you're under arrest for interfering with an arrest. How could I have interfered with an arrest when I was the only one being arrested? Shit. Boy, you're under arrest for interfering with an officer in the discharge of duties. Very well. I'd like to make a phone call, please. The officer grunted and pointed to a phone. Thank you, sir. Department of Justice, Washington, D.C., please. Bob ignored the officer's <laughs> snickers. Yes, hello, this is Robert Moses. May I speak with John Doerr, please? The officers exchanged nervous glances as Bob confidently talked to the lawyer for the Justice Department. How the hell did that Negro get through to Washington? Damned if I know. Yes, John. They've arrested me. Well, obviously because they're intimidated by me legally helping people exercise their right to vote. Yes, sir. I'll keep you posted if they try anything else. Bye-bye. Bob finished his call and turned back to the officers. They swept him away to an extremely biased trial where he was found guilty and given a 90-day suspended sentence and a $5 court fee. All due respect, gentlemen, but I will not be paying that fine. Anybody can see I've committed no crime. For that... Bob was placed in jail for a few days until the NAACP bailed him out. McCombs NAACP president took Bob to nearby Amite County. Here he met up with their branch president, E.W. E.W. wiped sweat from his brow and waved as Bob walked up to the whitewashed front porch. Welcome, Mr. Moses. I've been expecting you. Thank you for inviting me, Mr. Steptoe. I know you folks risked a lot in doing this. In case you haven't noticed yet, Mississippi wasn't exactly the friendliest to African Americans, and Amite County was actually one of the most dangerous parts for them. Journalist Jack Newfeld, who wrote for publications such as Village Voice and New York Post, once referred to the area as the Ninth Circle of Hell. The first thing we ought to do is set up a voting school to educate everyone on their rights and how to obtain voter registration. I thought we could use the church here on my farm as a classroom. Wonderful idea. Now how do we get everyone here? The houses are farther apart than I thought. Herbert, who had remained quietly in the background, timidly approached. I have a car, sir. I can drive you and others wherever you need lickety split. With that settled, the men got to work. It was slow going at first. Even though Amite County's population was predominantly black, it had the highest amount of Ku Klux Klan members in the state, so most African Americans were too intimidated to learn how to vote. Nevertheless, Bob, E.W., and Herbert gathered up around five people at a time and taught them within the little church's walls. Bob addressed the small group gathered on the folding chairs. Now, I won't say it's not dangerous out there. A few more of our brothers registered successfully last week without any problems, but I've heard the rumblings of rumors that the white folks are planning something for us tomorrow. Whatever you do, be peaceful and polite. We're not doing anything illegal if we back down. They've won. Herbert, it'll just be Curtis and preaching Knox with me, so if you want to take the day off from driving, I'll handle it. Yes, sir. All right, gentlemen. Let's go home and get ourselves a good night's rest. Herbert cozied up next to his wife, Prince, in their bedroom. 
She closed her book and set it on the nightstand. You've been quiet in a fox chasing a field mouse and haven't turned a single page of that book. Now what's wrong? This voting business has me worried, Herb. Folks around here can be meaner than a wet panther and I don't want nothing bad happening to you. We have nine mouths to feed, you know. I know it. Prince, you know I try and avoid racist folk when we with the children. But this is something I gotta fight for. I want our babies to grow up in a world where they don't have to worry about making their political voices heard. Just promise me you'll be careful. I will. The next evening, E.W. slowly rocked back and forth in a rocking chair on his front porch. He waited nervously for Bob and the two voters to return, and when their car pulled up, E.W. jumped up to greet them. Sweet Jesus, Bob! What happened? A bloodied Bob looked up at E.W. His face was injured so badly that E.W. almost didn't recognize him. Blue Jack casting got us. As we're leaving, he attacked me with the end of his knife. That Billy is thirsty for nigger blood. He'd string all of us up from an oak if he could and get away with it, because he's the sheriff's cousin. E.W. wiped at Bob's face. Shit. We gots to get you over to Doc Henry's place. Bob would end up needing eight stitches for the three gashes. I'm gonna press charges on that boy, but this, this was a good thing. How can you say it's a good thing? You're scared, Mr. Steptoe. These white people thought this was just a phase we were going through. But now they're realizing we're very serious and might soon be changing their hateful ways. Billy Jack Caston did go to trial for the attack, and Bob testified against him. But Bob wasn't allowed to witness the final decision, and as Herbert picked up his morning paper, he saw Billy was acquitted and shook his head. Morning, Herbert. Herbert looked up as E.H. Hurst approached. Morning, Mr. Congressman. Oh, please, Herbert. Call me Mr. Hurst. <laughs> what can I do for you this morning? Well, I've been thinking. You and I have been friends since we was knee-high to a pig's eye. I even helped you get a loan so you could have this here farm. I know it. Good, good. But you see, Herbert, it's this voting business. I I've seen you driving that Negro all over town since he arrived, and I think it's time you remembered your place. You have this wonderful dairy and cotton farm which more than provides for your family. What do you need to vote for? Wouldn't you want my family's support for your re-election? <laughs> Boy, I don't need you to win. I have the rest of our community. Now if you're smart, you'll stop driving that boy around and stick to picking cotton. It's what niggas do best after all. A canary yellow grin spread between E.H.'s sweaty lips. No, Eugene. What niggas do best is face a challenge until justice is served. Now I'll keep driving Bob around until every single Negro in this community is registered to vote. The canary melted from E.H.'s perspiring face. Mm-mm-mm. Very well, Lee. I hope you don't regret that choice. Good day. And good day to you too, Eugene. By September, the threats and intimidations hadn't stopped, so Bob called in backup in the form of his friend at the Department of Justice, John Doerr. They sat on E.W.'s front porch one evening and sipped iced tea. We've interviewed just about everyone in this town who's been facing threats for registering Bob. I think their spirits are a bit brighter now that we're here. Is there anything else we should know? E.W. bit his lip as he rocked back and forth. Just one thing, Mr. Doerr. My neighbor over yonder, E.H. Hurst, he's been making death threats for a few days now. John pulled out a notebook and pencil. Do you have the names he's mentioned? Yes, sir. He said me and George Reese, but Herbert Lee's come up the most. John nodded as he finished writing. I'll go and speak with the other two men tonight. We'll put a stop to this. But when John went to Herbert's home, he learned he was out on business. Having done what he could, John returned to D.C.
The next day, September 25th, Herbert filled his pickup with cotton and headed towards Liberty. As he passed by a state senator's house, E.H. and Billy Jack Caston watched him. Oh, there goes Lee. I have something to see him about. Can I borrow your truck, Billy? Billy gave the chubby-faced man a quizzical look, and E.H. responded by flashing a pistol at him from his shirt. Billy grinned. Here's the key. Teach those niggers what happens when they cross us. As Herbert sweated in line at the cotton gin in Liberty, E.H. pulled up behind him and got out of the sparkling truck. He angrily tapped on Herbert's window with his gun. We gotta talk, Herbert. I'm not playing around this time. Herbert stared at the gun, then shifted his gaze to E.H.'s wicked face. I won't talk to you unless you put the gun down. E.H. did what he was asked, and Herbert slid out from the passenger side, his heart racing in his chest. The air was sticky hot, but it was welcome after being inside the stuffy truck. Herbert trudged around to the front of the rusted vehicle. You ain't running, boy. Several people had now gathered around to see what the commotion was. They watched as E.H. kicked up dust running to meet Herbert, sunlight fulgurating off the metal of his pistol. I don't want any trouble, Eugene. I, I just want... No! Why you do that to E.H.'s hand quivered slightly as he lowered the weapon and leered down at his dead friend. Scarlet liquid slowly eked out from Herbert's soft brown skin. Skin that would no longer feel the heat of the day or be touched by his wife's gentle hands. The sheriff hustled over. Come on, E.H. Get in the car before those Negroes make a move on you. He whisked E.H. away, ignoring the flies slowly gathering around the feast of the open wound. One witness, African-American Lewis Allen, couldn't take his eyes off the traumatic scene. His thumbs never moved from the straps of his blue overalls. Ain't somebody gonna call the coroner. Ain't nobody gonna take that body. Y'all can't just leave him there. And yet, they did. Accounts differ, but Herbert's body laid uncovered in the sticky, stifling street for at least two hours, while coroners from different towns argued over who would be forced to take him in. Eventually, someone claimed him, but they needed a coroner's jury to help decide the cause of death. Sheriff Daniel Jones, unrelated to our voice actor and my boyfriend for the record, forcefully led Lewis into his car and drove off. Listen, boy, they're going to ask you a lot of questions. You're going to tell them that nigger threatened Mr. Hearst. Got it? But you hush up. There was money trouble between the two of them, and he wasn't going to pay Mr. Hearst. He grabbed a tire iron from his truck and was going to whack Mr. Hearst with it. Mr. Hearst fought for his life, and the gun accidentally discharged and killed him. Understand? With no other choice, Lewis nodded. Yes, sir. Five witnesses were called to testify. A.B. Westbrook and Jack Reynolds, who were both white, and Lewis, Jesse Anderson, and Reverend Orr Marshall, who were African American. As the courthouse doors opened, the men were greeted by a room filled with tall, muscular, and armed white men. In that terrifying situation, what other choice did they have but to give a false testimony? In the end, the all-white jury concluded the murder was justified since it was allegedly in self-defense. If you're thinking, what the actual fuck? Trust me, you aren't alone. (laughs) Herbert was given a funeral in which Bob Moses attended. Prince caught his eye and rushed across the lawn, her eyes moist with tears. This is your fault. If you hadn't come to this town, my husband would still be alive. You gave us black folk a false hope and heartache. You murdered Herbert, you son of a bitch. Bob didn't have any words for her and hung his head. He couldn't help but feel like she was right. Herbert's death was a heavy blow for him, as it was the first death due to being involved with SNCC. Bob packed his bags and prepared to leave Amite County. 
The night before he left, he knocked on E.W.'s screen door. Oh. Good evening, Mr. Moses. Evening. I had to stop by and say goodbye. If I can't protect you folks from white retaliation, then I have no business being here. <clears throat> Both men turned to see Lewis Allen timidly approaching. Mr. Moses, my name's Lewis Allen. I was one of the men there when Herbert was murdered. The, the white folks forced me to lie on the stand, and well, I did it to protect my family. If I told them the truth, they'd kill them and me. They sure would, Mr. Allen. I haven't been able to sleep. See, it's one thing to lie about a man who's still alive. You can apologize to him and hope he'll understand. But a dead man? Well, you can't ask for his forgiveness. Bob thought it over and wound up calling the Department of Justice again to see if maybe his friend John Doerr could reopen the case. John Doerr was denied three times by the FBI before they finally agreed to take another look at the murder. Lewis agreed to testify but requested protection, and unfortunately the Justice Department wasn't able to grant his request. Faced once again with a room of intimidating white men, Lewis repeated his previous false testimony, and E.H. Hurst was never punished for murdering Herbert Lee. Word got out that Lewis was considering telling the truth, and the white folks in town began threatening him. The day before he was going to move out of town, Lewis was discovered dead in his front lawn. His murder still remains officially unsolved to this day, even though it's been reinvestigated in recent years. Hi, welcome. On May 25th, 2020, nearly 60 years after Herbert's murder, a 46-year-old man entered a Minneapolis convenience store. Perhaps you've heard his name. If you have, say it with me loud and as strongly as you can. George Floyd. Just the cigarettes? Yes, sir. Ten dollars. Out of twenty? Have a good night. The employee watched George leave and scrutinized the bill. He picked up the phone and dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? I'm working down at the Quickies, Martin. This guy just gave me a counterfeit 20. George Floyd paused as cops swarmed around him. One of them, Derek Chauvin, held George on the ground with his knee pressed on the back of George's neck. Onlookers pleaded with the officers. Oh my god, get off him! He needs help! The records differ as to how long Derek held George like this, but a New York Times report says that based on a timestamp video, it was longer than the 7 minutes and 46 seconds that some people have reported. But let's be real. The time doesn't really matter because George Floyd was killed while Derek pressed down on his neck. Whether you believe George Floyd was guilty or not, quite frankly, doesn't matter to me. What we know is the Minneapolis Police Department broke protocol and decided that George was guilty until proven innocent. Oh, I'm sorry, last I knew, it was innocent until proven guilty. The point I'm trying to make is this. About 60 years ago, a black man was murdered in broad daylight by a white politician who was whisked away by a sheriff who made sure that witnesses lied on the stand. Now, the four officers involved in George Floyd's murder were all fired the next day. But why is it that 60 years later, people still hold this bullshit bias that all African Americans are criminals? Look, I really strive to not get political on this podcast because it's about true crime and not politics. But the deaths of innocent people like Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Stefan Clark, and so, so many others falls into the category of true crime in my eyes. I think it's time that we, and more specifically cops, take a look again at what Atticus Finch told his daughter Scout. It's a sin to kill a mockingbird. Lesson from a Mockingbird was written, narrated, and edited by me, Skylar Fastenau, and produced by Daniel Jones. 
Voice talent was provided by Maurice Whitfield, Tamara Perry, Jeremy Staple, Walker Barnes, Jermel Deschwan, and Shatara Irvin. You know, I'm so glad you joined us for our second season finale. A percentage of proceeds from this episode will go to Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and charities honoring George Floyd. So if you like what you heard and feel empowered now, please leave us a five-star rating, review, or both on your favorite podcasting app. It might not seem like much, but it helps us out more than you can imagine. You can also share our show with the true crime lovers in your life so they can enjoy it just as much as you have. We will be taking a little break from our regularly scheduled programming, but I've already started the episodes for our third season and cannot wait to share them with you. We're scheduled to be back Wednesday, September 2nd with a new episode every single week. Oh yes, I just said we're going to become a weekly podcast. Get excited! To get regular updates on what we're doing, meet the cast, or find out more about today's story that we just didn't have time to cover, be sure to follow the original Deadtime Stories on Instagram and Facebook. The links to those pages are in the episode description. Until next time, stay safe out there. I don't want you to be the next chapter's topic on the original Deadtime Stories.